Maria Ridolf would have been old enough to be a grandmother by the time someone was held accountable for stealing her life. Jack McCullough returned to Sycamore in handcuffs on July 27, 2011, the same day authorities brought Maria Ridolf up out of the ground. He was an old man, stooped, with white hair, thick spectacles, and a long surgical scar from a quadruple bypass snaking down his chest. She was tiny, caught in time at age seven, all mummified skin and bones. Police and prosecutors gathered at Sycamore's historic Elmwood Cemetery as dawn broke on a glorious summer morning. The Rydolph family plot was tucked in a back corner, in the shade of a majestic elm tree, much like the one Maria once played under. A backhoe stood at the ready. State Police Investigator Brian Hanley waited on the sidelines with prosecutors Clay Campbell and Julie Trevarthen watching in awed silence. All felt a powerful connection to Maria. Trevarthen, who had gotten the Ridolph family's blessing to exhume Maria so her remains could be searched for traces of DNA, saw an overwhelming irony in the timing of events. Maria would rise up on the same day the SOB came back to Sycamore. Hanley felt it, too. The slain second grader had been the central focus of his life for three years as his own children circled their seventh birthdays. He would leave the news conferences and photo ops to others as he remained by Maria's side. They could handle the living. He stood vigil for the dead. An unearthly stench accompanied Maria out of her grave. She had not been embalmed in 1958 because her body had been exposed to the elements for so long before it was found. Instead, the funeral home sprinkled lime on her remains. Her little white coffin was taken from the cemetery to the coroner's office in the basement of the building that also houses the jail. Prosecutors, investigators, and forensics experts filled every inch of the small room. Campbell, a short man, climbed on top of a table in the back corner to get a better view. Trevarthen pushed her way toward the front, and when they opened the casket, she thought at first that she was looking at a doll. One foot was mummified, and they could see Maria's hair and wizened muscles. In a corner of the coffin, a jar held her jaw and teeth. Maria had been identified through her dental records. No DNA was recovered, but at last, they would learn the cause of death, something the crude autopsy and coroner's inquest had not accomplished in 1958. Maria was stabbed to death. Krista Latham, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Indianapolis, pointed out nicks made by a sharp blade in the child's sternum and the vertebrae of her neck. Someone had plunged a long, sharp knife into Maria's throat and slashed downward at least three times. The man police and prosecutors held responsible was on his way to the Sycamore jail. As he was driven through town, Jack McCullough pointed out his childhood home, and Maria's. He said nothing as they passed through the intersection at Archie Place and Center Cross Street, the place where Johnny grabbed Maria. While the grim work in the morgue continued, Campbell stepped outside for a break. A fierce storm approached from the west, complete with glowering clouds and wind gusts strong enough to knock a man down. He watched it arrive with breathtaking fury in a moment that felt epic to Campbell, perhaps even biblical. Trevarthen likes to think that Maria had a special greeting for McCullough as he arrived at the jail. Though the air-conditioned morgue is in the basement, the stench of Maria's corpse traveled through the air ducts and permeated the building for days. The prosecutor hopes it haunted McCullough in his cell. The suspect seemed anything but haunted during his extradition from Seattle to Sycamore. He acted more like a kid on a field trip. McCullough got the window seat in the last row of the early morning United Airlines flight to Chicago. He talked a blue streak, 
and it didn't take long for other passengers to realize a murder suspect was on board. By then, he had read the affidavit police submitted for his arrest and learned some details of the case against him. He altered his claims about his movements on December 3, 1957, the night Maria was snatched. He knew they had an unused train ticket to Chicago, so now he said he hadn't taken the train. He'd hitchhiked. He no longer said his father picked him up in Rockford either. He thumbed his way home. Was McCullough changing his story so his alibi would match the facts unearthed in the investigation? Or had reading the affidavit genuinely refreshed his memory? The Seattle cops escorting McCullough had seen it all before. Cloyd Steiger had 32 years on the force. His former partner on homicide, Mike Sisinski, was now the department's one-man cold case squad. Sisinski had the center seat next to their prisoner. At one point, McCullough pointed his finger in the detective's face. All I need to do to beat this case is convince one juror, he said, like Casey Anthony did. All I need is one juror. He talked about Maria's beauty, as he had during his interrogation, comparing her to a little Barbie doll. His voice took on an almost sensual quality. It gave Steiger the creeps. When their plane touched down in Chicago, local cops and Illinois State Police took McCulloch off the plane and loaded him into an SUV. Siasinski and Steiger rode with him as the motorcade pulled out of O'Hare International Airport and headed toward Sycamore. McCulloch kept up his rant about how he could beat this rap. Pay attention to the timeline, pay attention to how long it takes to get from Chicago to Sycamore because it's very important, he told the cops. He believed the timeline would prove his innocence. With decades of experience interviewing murder suspects, Steiger felt like he was being hustled by a sociopath with a constantly shifting story. The detective stroked McCullough's ego, hoping for the big reveal, but it never came. He's a weird guy. He's a slamming narcissist. There's no question about that, Steiger said later. He's smarter than everybody in the place. Their motorcade stopped for lunch at a steak and shake and McCullough gobbled down a hamburger, fries and a glass of milk. He also kept talking. Steiger parked himself at a table behind the prisoner and wrote down everything he said on a paper placemat. The sycamore that McCullough was coming home to wasn't the Mayberry he remembered. It had grown from 7,000 residents to 17,000 in the years he'd been gone. While the downtown area still boasted brick storefronts and tree-lined streets, the country roads were now cluttered with strip malls and fast food joints. As they rode through town, McCullough pointed out the lot where he'd bought the car that had been his pride and joy. The Seattle cops finally felt they had heard enough from their prisoner. They signaled to their driver to head to the jail. As they approached the back entrance, they spotted a line of television satellite trucks. Reporters and camera operators closed in on the SUV. His wrists were shackled to a waist chain, but McCullough smiled and tried to wave. They're all here for me, he exclaimed. Sex has always been an underlying theme in this case and McCullough would face a rape trial before he'd be tried for the murder of Maria. During the investigation, his half-sister Jean told police that her brother raped her and shared her with two friends when she was 14. The attack occurred, she said, at a house near Elmwood Cemetery in 1961 or 1962, while he was between stints in the military. The statute of limitation should have expired long ago, but McCullough, who was then known as John Tessier, had spent so little time in Illinois that the clock had stopped ticking. Prosecutors felt the rape case against McCullough was stronger than the murder case. Their witness was impressive. 
Jean Tessier held advanced degrees from prestigious universities, taught college classes, and counseled the parents of terminally ill children. She was 64, a woman of profound faith who never went anywhere without her dog spirit. She wore her snow-white hair in a long braid down her back and dressed in flowing patterned tops and scarves. Jean took the witness stand when the rape trial began in April 2012, and she was followed by a woman flown in from Tacoma, Washington. Michelle Weinman was just 15 when she told authorities in 1982 that John Tessier had sexually assaulted her. He was a Milton, Washington police officer then, and charged with statutory rape. He was able to plead the case down to a misdemeanor, but it ended his career. With Weinman as their witness, prosecutors would argue that McCullough had a history of taking advantage of girls. The defense attorneys had made a strategic decision to try the case before a judge instead of a jury. A judge would focus on the legal issues and problems with evidence in a case this old, they thought, while jurors might be swayed by their emotions. Indeed, Judge Robin Stuckert had serious questions. Why did the accuser wait decades to mention the crime? Prosecutors were frustrated that they couldn't explain that the rape allegation surfaced during a murder investigation. Any mention of murder would be prejudicial. Jean had dealt with her trauma her own way and talked about the abuse to police only because they were looking into the Rudolph case. She didn't want to file charges, but agreed to go along if it would help the investigation. The judge also questioned why there were so many holes in Jean's story, so many contradictions. Did the attack occur during the summer or the winter? Why could no one else remember the red convertible she said her brother drove? Why did Jean remember being dragged down a hallway when the bungalow where the attack allegedly occurred had none? The judge acquitted McCullough and excoriated prosecutors. Campbell in turn blasted the judge on the courthouse steps. He said the verdict was a miscarriage of justice and called Stuckert's criticism of his office a travesty. Jean Tessier, meanwhile, unloaded on Campbell in a signed letter published by the local newspaper. She said she felt like she'd been victimized a second time. Jack McCullough was so pleased with the outcome of his rape trial that he wanted Judge Stuckert to decide the murder case as well. Forget about a jury of his peers. He viewed Stuckert as brilliant and thought he'd found a friend on the bench. But the judge's war of words with Campbell after her verdict led Stuckert to step down from the murder trial. Judge James C. Halleck was brought in from neighboring Kane County Halleck, an associate judge who over the past decade had mostly presided over family court, traffic, and drunken driving cases, was considered a promising jurist, but had little experience trying murder cases. As a lawyer, his civil practice had focused on landlord-tenant disputes and foreclosures. He told the attorneys he had heard some talk about the Ridolf case around the Kane County Courthouse but wouldn't let it affect his decisions. Before the trial began, Halleck made two key rulings. Both dealt with hearsay evidence. Based on the judge's pre-trial rulings, it became a situation in which we sort of tried the case with our hands tied behind our backs, says DeKalb County Public Defender Tom McCulloch. I think it was an incredibly thin case. Two types of testimony are presented at trial. Direct testimony is what witnesses saw and heard with their own eyes and ears. Hearsay testimony is what someone else told them they saw or heard, because the accused has a right to confront witnesses through cross-examination. Hearsay testimony generally is not permitted, but there are certain exceptions, especially when witnesses have died. The Ridolf case had been reopened because of a statement made by McCulloch's dying mother in 1994. 
Nearly four decades after Maria's kidnapping, Eileen Tessier told her daughter Janet, those two little girls, and the one that disappeared, John did it. Prosecutors successfully argued that this statement qualified for a hearsay exception. Eileen Tessier could have been exposed to criminal charges for covering for her son. Her deathbed statement, prosecutors argued, was made against her own interests. Halleck said he would allow Janet Tessier to testify about what her mother told her on her deathbed. He'd decide later how much weight to give the statement. The judge also ruled on a hearsay exception sought by McCulloch's defense attorneys. They wanted the 1957 FBI reports on the case allowed in as evidence. The documents, they argued, were key to their client's alibi. Illinois does not allow police reports, including FBI reports, to take the place of testimony from actual witnesses. Usually the authors of the reports, the cops and investigators themselves, are put on the stand. But in this case, all the FBI agents who'd been involved were dead. The reports show that Tessier had once been a suspect in the kidnapping but was cleared after FBI agents gave him a lie detector test. Then 18, Tessier claimed he was 40 miles away, trying to enlist in the Air Force. At the time Maria was snatched from the street corner, his parents and recruiters in Chicago and Rockford verified his whereabouts. He was in Chicago in the morning and in Rockford at about 7.15 p.m., the defense argued that the hearsay rule barring the police reports is meant to protect the defendant. In this case, the defense wanted the reports admitted, and if the judge rejected that request, they argued, the reports could come in as historic records because they were more than 20 years old. Halleck rejected both arguments. The FBI reports would not be admitted as evidence. There was, however, another way for the alibi to be heard. The defendant could take the stand and testify to what he told the FBI about his whereabouts on the afternoon and early evening of December 3, 1957. But this option was a potentially dangerous move for a defendant who had told conflicting stories during his police interrogation and displayed such an odd demeanor at times. Even his defense team acknowledged that McCullough could be his own worst enemy on the stand. He would be open to cross-examination by prosecutors who could ask him about strange details noticed by an Air Force recruiter the day after the kidnapping. How did he get that cut on his lip? Why did he bring up the kidnapping that had occurred in his hometown? And why did he show off a little black book with the names, addresses, and measurements of girls in Sycamore? The hearsay ruling seemed one-sided to the defense, and the outcome felt inevitable to McCullough. As soon as the judge ruled this stuff wouldn't... As soon as the judge ruled this stuff wouldn't be admitted, I knew, Oh man, I'm toast. Kathy Sigmund Chapman found it unnerving to come face to face with Johnny after all those years. She couldn't take her eyes off the defendant as she testified during his trial in September 2012. He stared right back at her. My goodness, Kathy Sigmund Chapman said when she saw this newspaper photo of herself as a child. He seemed to Kathy to be smirking, like he was sure he would beat the charges. She was resolute on the witness stand as she recounted the story she'd told so many times before. How she played duck the cars with her best friend Maria. How a friendly stranger who called himself Johnny offered them piggyback rides. She recounted how Maria and Johnny were gone when she returned from a quick trip home to fetch her mittens. She was shown an old newspaper photograph of herself as a child displaying those mittens. My goodness, she said. Kathy stood her ground when she was shown the same six photos of suspects she'd seen in 2010. She was firm in her conviction that she had identified the right person and without hesitation went straight to the fourth picture from the left. This photo right there, she said, tapping the picture of John Tessier. 
On cross-examination, McAuliffe's defense attorney pointed out that Tessier's photo differed from the others, but he couldn't shake Kathy. That picture was slightly different than other pictures, is it not? Is that fair to say? he asked. No, it was the picture of Johnny, she said. Eventually, Kathy acknowledged that the young man in the photo she chose wasn't wearing a suit as the others were, and she agreed that the background in his photo was darker. But, she insisted, it didn't matter. I wasn't looking at background. She said she focused on the man's features. Janet Tessier testified about her mother's dramatic deathbed statement, recounting the story in a straightforward fashion, without drama or embellishment. Asked why she didn't prod her mother for more details, she responded that she was reacting as a daughter, not an investigator. The defense countered with its own witness, Janet's sister Mary Hunt, who'd also been at her mother's side when she was dying. Hunt reluctantly testified that she heard her mother say only, he did it. She could not say who he was or what it was. Three jailhouse snitches who came forward, two of them just days before the trial, testified about conversations they had with McCullough's at the DeKalb County Jail. They all said he admitted killing Maria, but each gave a slightly different account of the killing and all said Maria died by strangling or suffocation. They didn't name the cause of death determined by a forensic anthropologist. Stabbing. Jailhouse snitches are notoriously unreliable. They are criminals, or at least accused of crimes, so their credibility is suspect. Most inmates who offer testimony are looking to cut a deal for themselves by hanging someone else out to dry. Kirk Swaggerty, Christopher Diaz, and a third inmate who testified under the pseudonym John Doe had been locked up with McCullough on cell block G. Swaggerty was the first to provide information. He wrote a letter to the state's attorney's office. His motive, he said, was to do the right thing.